on. So when we talk about the rise of Richard Nixon, and I think really the rise of Nixon is probably one of the most transformative events of American politics. Here you have, uh, and, and it's transformative insofar as it's in 1968 that you have the beginnings of the major party realignments where all of a sudden now we start seeing the South as a Republican part of the United States, whereas previously what party had dominated the American South? The Democrats. It's also where um, we begin to see a, for lack of a better word, a semi-permanent settlement of Republican presidents. If you look at the Republican presidents after LBJ it goes Nixon, Ford is president by succession, then you have Reagan, Bush the, young, Bush the elder, and then Bush the younger. And so for much of the second half of the 20th century and into the early 21st century, the Republican Party plays a major role after being in the dark from 1928 to 1952. Um, but let's kind of uh, re-sketch the timeline if it's something that I have on a previous podcast. Oh, well. So, 1960, Nixon loses to Kennedy. In a closely contested election. Again, very small electoral map. We had talked about that when we talked about the electoral uh, the election of Kennedy. Actually, let me see if I can bring that up on the map for you. Because this might be a ring around the... Um, ring around the rosy of... Historic elections. Let me do that real quick. 1960. So if I look at the election in 1960, you're talking less than 100,000 votes, and you'll notice. Oh, it would help if y'all could actually see the screen. Here we go. So here's the election of 1960. Nixon lost the popular vote by less than 100,000, and you'll notice that it's kind of a mishmash of red and blue states. You, you do see the South voting as a bloc, except here's Florida all by itself. You have most of the far west voting as a bloc, except for New Mexico and Nevada, and the Midwest is a combination breaking Republican and Democrat. It was a close election, um, and not a very ideologic one. <laughs> What I mean by that, and this gets into um, a wider theory that I haven't had a chance to expound upon, is that for much of American politics after the Civil War and after the New Deal, you had a very narrow political space. What do I mean by a very narrow political space? the differences between the political parties. So think about this for a moment. If you're a Republican, or if you're a Democrat, first of all, at this point in American history, are both parties, uh, for lack of a better word, comprised of people of faith. Christianity is still the dominant major figure of the religion. Now, Again, if you're a Republican, you might be more apt to be Protestant, whereas, again, the Democrats have Catholics in their coalition and Jews in their coalition to numbers that the Republicans don't have, although there are plenty of Republican Jews. And so you have a fear of God, so you wouldn't have... Um, uh, we don't think of either party as being atheistic. Are both parties anti-communist? Yes. You have, um, for the most part, uh, both of them are advocating property rights, both of them are advocating growing the American middle class, and so in terms of the political space of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party uh, at that time, the gulf between them is relatively small, and you have a lot of people voting on what I would call ethno-familiar lines. When I mean ethno-familiar lines, I mean, okay, I'm voting Republican because that is my family affiliation. I'm voting Republican because my parents voted Republican, or I'm voting Democrat because I'm Irish and my family voted Democrat. You get the idea. Are there people who still vote in those veins today? Yes. Now, would we actually describe the space between the Republican and Democratic Party as narrow or broad today? Very broad. You have um, also something else. 
Do you have... Uh, you don't, the issues you don't have, you don't have gun control as a major issue, you don't have abortion as a major issue, you don't have the highly divisive issues that are in our politics today in the 1960s. These were largely debates about unions, tax rates, and how, what good communist fighting looks like. So do you see how it's a very narrow space in the, 1960s, in the early 1960s, but now it's broadened in our modern times? And so... Nixon loses in 1960. 1962, he tries to run for the governorship of California. He loses that. Okay. 19... So, after losing the presidency and losing his home state of California, um... He thinks he's done. And he gives his last press conference and he tells the reporters, you won't have Richard Nixon to kick around anymore. In six short years, he will go from being down and out to being president. And six years after that, he will go from being president to, be, to resigning. Now, there's a lot of things that happen between here and there. So, let's get into very quickly, the election of 1964. 1964, Goldwater loses to LBJ. Now, I believe yesterday, I, or not yesterday, Thursday, I showed y'all the Daisy ad, and I, showed, I did not show you uh, Reagan's Time for Choosing speech. I think I'm actually going to talk about that in the 80s. But here's the thing that happens. Let me show you how bad the loss is for Goldwater. Here's 64. Oh, cool. LBJ carried every state except Arizona, which was Goldwater's home state, and the South. What's interesting? The South voted Republican. Now, what's interesting is Goldwater, in addition to being strong on defense, the doctrine of peace through strength, which did appeal to the patriotism of people in the South, also was a big believer in states' rights. Even if that allows the state to do horrible things. And so, that's interesting, but if I'm a Republican and I look at this map, this is a bad map for me, isn't it? Now let me tell you what happened, and I've said it several times. What you had was in the election of 1964, the Republican coalition split. You had in the Republican Party two factions. One was the progressive wing of the Republican Party led by Nelson Rockefeller, who is the descendant of John D. And then you had Goldwater. Now again, the Goldwater faction I can readily describe as a type of Western libertarianism. His center of power is Arizona and California. I know we don't think of California as a libertarian state, but in 1964 it was. And in 1968 it was, because California is the end of the frontier. And so one of the things that is kind of interesting is, okay, we think about Silicon Valley as the heart of technology and very progressive, but one of the reasons Silicon Valley was the heart of technology is the land was cheap and the government intervention was slight back when Silicon Valley got started. By the way, is the government interventions in California slight now? To the point of being predatory, and in this, in this our Texan state, where are most of our migrants coming from California. They're refugees fleeing a Soviet state. No? Too soon for that joke? I was going to make another bad joke, but anyway, here you have these hapless refugees. They don't share our customs and don't speak our language. But enough about our friends from California. No? <laughs> Republicans are dealt a horrible defeat. They know that Part of the reason they lost is you had a large portion of the Republican electorate voting for the Democrat LBJ rather than voting for Goldwater, who they thought was going to start a nuclear war with the Russians. Did I show you all the Daisy ad? Yes? Yes. Thursday? The little girl, the countdown, the atomic blast? Yes. yes. Okay. So now, so you have a split in the Republican Party gives the Democrats a supermajority. Okay? 
Now, what's interesting is when Ronald Reagan was, shill- was campaigning for Goldwater, many of the Great Society programs had either not yet been passed or were still in their infancy. They had not seen the transformative effects of the expansion of the government bureaucracy by virtue of the Great Society and its effect on the United States. So think about this for a moment. Prior to the Great Society, you did not have food stamps and you did not have housing projects. How many of you know people who make the complaint uh, that food stamps actually deter work? How many of you know people who've made that argument? How many of you have seen the assertion made that really the housing projects are the ghettos that we've just taken poor people and moved them to the inner city? So in 1964, those programs hadn't met their fullest flavor. By 1968, they had begun the costs of those programs, both to the American psyche and to the American finance, had begun to make themselves plain. But also, the agitations of the social protest movement, while benign in 1964, had reached a fever pitch in 1968. So let me just sort of tell you how chaotic 1968 was. 1968 is considered one of the most chaotic times in American history. January of 1968, North Korea seizes the USS Pueblo, and the North Vietnamese Army and the Viet Cong staged the Tet Offensive. In February, there are massive civil rights protests in Carolina, Wisconsin, and uh, Chapel Hill. In March, the issue of the Vietnam Vietnam War drives a wedge inside the Democratic Party. You have uh, anti-war candidates like Eugene McCarthy and Bobby Kennedy uh, posing as primary challengers to LBJ uh, on the issue of Vietnam. So, 1968, originally LBJ is thinking about running for re-election. March, he's up against people who want the United States out of the war. You have the protest movement outside of the White House chanting, Hey, hey, LBJ, how many boys did you kill today? And this was demoralizing for Johnson. And so in March, which if you think about it, when do we start presidential primaries? Not in March. You started in September of the previous year. In March, LBJ announces he would not seek re-election. So let's go real quick to 1968. You have, in the Democratic Party, you have the immigrants, you have the unions, you have the South, and within that you have the Dove faction and the War faction. You have Democrats who are against the war, and you have, and in that you also have the protest movement. So this Dove faction, and you do have some overlap. Okay. So you're the Democratic Party. Your sitting president decides he doesn't want to run again. Who do you put in? Why the vice president, of course. So, the Democratic establishment puts in the sitting vice president, Hubert Humphrey, to replace LBJ as the lead of the ticket. April 4th, Martin Luther King is assassinated outside of the Lorraine, uh, outside of the Lorraine Hotel in Memphis. Riots ensue in every major American city with an African American population. Cities from New York all the way to Louisville are in flames. The army had to be called in to occupy Washington, D.C. for the first time since MacArthur expelled the Bonus Army. Y'all remember Ferguson, don't you? Picture a Ferguson-style situation in every major American city. Picture it in Washington, D.C. where they have to bring in the army to put it down. Does that give you an idea of just how chaotic 68 was? April 11th, LBJ signs the Civil Rights Act of 1968, which prohibited racial discrimination in terms of housing. Prima facie, a good and wholesome law. 
However, for a generation of people whose only experience uh, may well, with people of color may well have been news reports of agitation, the idea of those people coming soon to a neighborhood near you was something that a lot of people couldn't live with. And as if the spring wasn't crazy enough, the summer of 68 was far more exciting. June 5th, Robert Kennedy is assassinated by the Palestinian activist Sirhan Sirhan in the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. In late... Oh, uh, in, in uh, July, black militants led by Fred Evans will have a shootout in Glenville, Ohio. In August, all hell will break loose as uh, in Chicago as anti-war protesters clash with police outside the Democratic National Convention. The Democratic Party nominates their establishment candidate Hubert Humphrey, angering the dove wing of the party and the social protest movement, who had first coalesced around Bobby Kennedy and then around Eugene McCarthy. So why didn't they coalesce around Bobby Kennedy? Because Bobby Kennedy died on June 5th. Then they coalesced around Eugene McCarthy. In September, feminists, again, associated with the protest movement, protest the Miss America pageant as a form of exploitation. This marks the beginning of agitation by second wave feminists. First wave feminists are your suffragettes. These are the ones who are fighting for the right to vote. Second wave feminists, uh, and again, first wave feminists are people seeking the vote to be better wives, better mothers, better Christians. But if I look at second wave feminism, Second wave feminism went well beyond notions of equality, equal pay for equal work. Second wave feminism posited that the notion of the entire existing social and religious order was designed for their enslavement and oppression. They sought to be liberated from the expectations of society when it came to female virtues, chastity, piety, patience, charity. Instead, they wanted to be liberated from the standard female obligations of being a wife and a mother to pursue their careers. To the traditional religion, the combination of birth, the birth control pill would allow a woman to break the curse of Eve from the Garden of Eden. Unlike their sisters ten years earlier, many of these women did not go to college to find a man, but had to deal with the cognitive dissonance of going to college to get a degree and then also tending to the expectations of being a wife and mother. So think about this for a moment. You have the protest movement of the African Americans, now seen as dangerous by virtue of the riots. You have the protest movement of feminism, seen as a vile bacchanal cult devoted to sexuality with no responsibility. In October, U.S. Olympics, the medalists, and I have their names presently, in October, the Mexico City Games, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, two African-American men who placed first and third in the 200-meter run during the customary playing of the American National Anthem, raised their fists in the Black Power salute as a sign of defiance and an international embarrassment. I've got the image. So think about this for a moment. We use this symbol as a sign of liberation, which it is in our modern context, but at the time, in 1968, in the throes of the Cold War, the Olympics, which are an expression of national patriotism, this is people airing America's dirty laundry on the international stage. Does that make sense? Do you see why this would offend people? Did anything happen to them? Um, I, they, they, it, there are repercussions to follow. I kind of don't want to deal with this in too many lurid details because I've got more things to go through. So if you think about it, cities on fire, discourse at home, people not minding the traditional religion and international embarrassment abroad. The Democrats go from controlling the House, the Senate, and the Presidency. If you see your world like that, do you think you want to give the party in power another two to four years? No. So in November of 1968, people registered their disgust with the welfare state and the social protest movement. The Republicans united behind the familiar face, the Vice President from the good old days of We Like Ike. The ethos was simple. Elect Nixon 
and we'll have it like we used to under Eisenhower. By the way, under Eisenhower, was the economy booming? Yes. Was there peace and prosperity at home? Mm -hmm. Yes. And Nixon promised to bring back law and order. In the South, many Democrats disgusted with the party's embrace of ethnic and gender politics and away from traditional values voted against the Democratic Party by voting for the segregationist George Wallace. Let me show you the map of 1968. Because I want to speak to something that's 64, that's 60, 68. You know, and historians want to talk about the Wallace effect. I've often said, Many historians talk about the Wallace effect because there are so many people who cannot believe that people with enthusiasm voted for Richard Nixon. If you look at the situation, why did they vote for Richard Nixon with such enthusiasm? That the events of 1968 made the current Democratic administration an existential threat to people's sense of reality. Look at how many states Nixon carried. Now let me actually show you the math. 301 to Humphreys, 191. Now, if I had added Wallace's 9 million to Humphreys, 30 million, yes, Wallace would have won the popular vote. Would he have won the Electoral College? Not at all. And also, do you think the American South, having been fed up with the chaos and tumult brought to you by LBJ, was going to vote for the Democrats when, as a bloc, the South had voted for Goldwater in 64? You get the idea. And so, while many historians try and paint Nixon as a vile and despicable man, there were people who voted wholeheartedly for that man. Because, oh my God, the Democrats putting up the establishment candidate and getting the one person the protest movement didn't want. Too soon?